Hello and welcome to the Aviatrix Book Review. I'm Liz Booker and I have a very special guest today who I'm so excited to talk to. She is a native of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, a C-130 pilot and lieutenant commander in the United States Coast Guard, and her story is featured in Chapter 10 of Anne McCallum Stat's High Flyers, 15 Inspiring Women Aviators and Astronauts. And the chapter is entitled Semper Paratus, Always Ready, which is the Coast Guard's motto. Lieutenant Commander Renakwa Russell, welcome. Thank you. Oh my God, I'm so excited <laughs> to talk with you. <laughs> oh man, you know, um, I just, I'm going to start out with uh, the Fab Five which I think is a fabulous title. And I don't know when it came up, uh, whether it was around the event of you receiving your air medal yes. um, or if it was before then, but I just think it's brilliant. And I love the model that you guys uh, have established for supporting each other in aviation. And we'll explain all that in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to put that out there to start with. Yes, it's we actually really have eight fun. now, so we're we haven't come up with a name, a good name. We're great. We have we're the, still the fine tuning that. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, so we had like as you know more of you know black women um, aviators started winging. Um, so I was five. We had six. We had a large bunch. It was like they had a picture go viral for a while, but there was like I want to say like fifteen or so um, or more like. Um, black students going through flight school for the coast guard which is like pretty unheard of just like you rarely see you know like women anything like black women black men so um it was kind of huge but they six seven and eight came pretty quickly um so we kind of like as we had more we were like we can't be the fat five anymore so we had like i can't remember what six was we had stupendous seven for a bit and then <laughs> we're, we're just having fun with it <laughs> good for you and good for you for for like reaching out and supporting each other. It's something that I think uh, it took a while for the women to figure out in the Coast Guard. I will just say, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Yes. <laughs> and and just uh, praise the, the way that you guys have gone about things. And I definitely will talk about that more later. But first, let's talk about you. Um, so you are a native of St. Thomas, the Virgin Islands. Uh, and you know, your story is in this wonderful book, High Flyers by Anne McCallum and Stats. And I interviewed Anne and I'll link to that interview um, in the show notes. But she covered 15 different people and mm -hmm. very heavy on the army, I will say. And I gave her a hard time about yes. that. But I was so yes. grateful and relieved to see our Coast Guard representation and mm -hmm. that it was you, it, well deserved. Um, cause you're a fabulous role model for everyone. But so tell us a little bit about you and the Virgin Islands and how that, like your interest in aviation and how that led you to the Coast Guard. Yes. So, yep. VI Massive. That's, that's what people see. Cause it's funny. So this was, I'm going to just answer questions. So that was one of the questions. There was a picture that went, you know, when the air metal thing went viral, people were like, oh, is it gang sign? It's actually Virgin Islands. So it's the V and the I, and I always throw it out. How do I do it? Like this? Yes, like that. <laughs> Virgin I mean, Islands. Virgin Islands. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Um, <laughs> VI. <laughs> but so yes, I'm born and raised in the Virgin Islands. And um, I guess my first spark of aviation um, kind of happened just so the Virgin Islands is an island. It's very small. And if you go anywhere, you have to travel. So I have a lot of family that lived in like other islands that lived in the States. And so from young, I kind of grew up traveling. My dad lived on another island. So American Eagle was like how I got to go see family just all the time. Um, so I loved flying as a kid and I did it, you know, so young. But the only interaction at the time I had was flight attendant. So I wanted to be a flight attendant actually as a little kid. Um, I have an uncle that flew for um, American Airlines. It was US Airways at the time. Obviously they merged with American um, and he had come home and he was like, you know, I think I was like at five or six. He was like, what do you want to be when you grow up or an uncle? What you tell, ask every kid. Um, and I was like, oh, I want to be a flight attendant. And he was like, 
I think you have the personality to be a pilot. And that was pretty much the seeds that he planted from like kid me to wanting to be a pilot. Um, how I wanted to go military was more so. So my um, grandparents were very involved in my childhood and my grandfather was a Korean War veteran. So I grew up kind of like hearing about, um, you know, the military his experiences, he was very regimented um, in a good way. <laughs> I think every kid needs. Um, but I had considered at the time going Navy because what my aunt um, and my uncle were both in the Navy. We grew up seeing them. We used to visit them over in um, Roosevelt Roads, which was a base um, yeah, in uh, Puerto Rico. So we would always go over and see them and then we'd visit them in Coronado. So I kind of was thinking Navy at the time um, when I was about like 13 or so in high school, these two pilots were, and it's so crazy because it's just how life works out. But um, they actually were like doing a destination wedding in St. John, which is the neighboring island from St. Thomas. They were looking for local entertainment. So I sang at the time, but my mom had a website because she sang and they found her website and they were like, hey, we want to have um, someone sing. And they were like, we saw you have a note we wanted. They didn't, they weren't going to have like, you know, bridesmaids or flower girls or anything. It was a destination wedding. So they were like, can your daughter sing at the wedding? And my mom was like, sure. So we met um, at them at the rehearsal dinner. So we'd never met these people before. Like it was literally just an email. Um, I remember going over, we went over, took the boat over to St. John and met them at the rehearsal dinner. The, um, it was a, the couple were both academy grads. I think it was like 99 and 2000, but, um, the wife's family traveled around the world, um, sailing. And so they had been to the Virgin Islands and that's why they wanted to come back and get married. So we met the family, we hit it off. Um, I sang at the wedding. They had a flyover from air station Barinkin, which was really cool. Um, and then at the reception, they were like, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And at the time I was like, I want to be a Navy pilot. Cause that's just who I was, ex that's who I know. Cause that was, you know, what my aunt and uncle did. And so they were like, well, have you ever considered the Coast Guard? And I was like, what? <laughs> I hadn't really heard about the Coast Guard. I mean, I probably saw them growing up because, you know, we have like auxiliary props. <laughs> Shout out to the auxiliary for always doing the boating safety courses. So I had seen the boating safety, but I hadn't really knew. I didn't know anything about the Coast Guard. My my family didn't either. Um, and so, yeah, they told me about the Coast Guard, but then specifically the Coast Guard Academy um, and the AIM program, which is the Academy Introduction like, Mission Program. So I did AIM that summer and I loved it. Like I had a blast. Um, <laughs> And I was like ready to sign up then and there. Um, I was too young. So I kind of, my way to the academy was a very roundabout way. I eventually made it because um, I did college beforehand in the Virgin Islands. So I was too young to go to the academy when I graduated high school. because so you have to be 17 at least. And I graduated at 16. So I did two years of college before going to the academy. <laughs> um, wow, lady. And did I see something about like a scholarship to Columbia too? I did. Yeah. So that's actually kind of what happened. So I had been, um, it was actually a program I was in. So I'd gotten a full ride when I applied. Um, I went to the, the high school I went to back in the Virgin Islands. They have a program with the university, the University of the Virgin Islands. It's called the Early Admissions Program. So you essentially do your freshman year of college and your senior year of high school at the same time. So I had applied for that my junior year, which is the same year AIM was. Um, and I did aim and then found out when I got back that I'd been accepted to the program, but then I was too young. So I did the, um, the early admissions program. The major I was in was a, a dual degree program. So you did three years at University of the Virgin Islands and then two years at Columbia. Um, and I did not go through the rest of that program because there had been, <laughs> there was some confusion on how the financial aid worked. So I had gotten a full ride, um, from UVI, but my scholarship only applied to UVI and I would have had to pay Columbia tuition, which um, even now, I mean, <laughs> back then that was 2000, 2008, 2000, 2000, well, I guess 2007. Yeah, it was um, 50,000 plus and did not have that money. And I knew from young, I kind of never really wanted to be in debt like that or have like large amounts of student loans. So that was actually like, I. 
it's funny. I remember my grandmother picked me up from class because I was young. I was like 16, 17. So my parents would pick me up to and from college. <laughs> um, so I remember my grandma picked me up and I they'd had like the info, like the representatives from Columbia had come and was like, this is what the program is like. So I'd pretty much given up trying to go to the academy because I was like, well, I have this other opportunity here. Um, but then I found out like, oh, you're going to have to pay a hundred thousand plus for schooling. And I don't have that money. And I didn't, um, qualify for like full ride for federal aid. Like I'd probably get some scholarship for federal aid, but I'd have to have taken out loans or something or grants. Um, and I was like devastated. I was in the car. My grandma picked me up and she was the one that said, well, what about the Coast Guard Academy? Like, why don't we see if they still want you? And I had sung the national anthem at my AIM graduation. <laughs> And so I got to like get my grandmother, my grandmother has a saying, she says, make yourself a name and not a number. And so she had called the academy and was like, and I was super embarrassed because I was just like, stop it, grandma. Um, <laughs> she had called the academy and was like, hey, my granddaughter sings like if you need somebody to do the national anthem. And so I got to like meet the director of admissions. So through that connection, years later, we like when things kind of went south with one program, my grandma called up the director and was like, Hey, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it, that's how I ended up coming back to the Academy through a very roundabout way and then graduated and here I am. Oh, what? That's such a great story. I love that. Uh, you know, it, how humiliating for you, but also how wonderful that your grandmother no, she's, initiative. she's like, <laughs> so I'm very like normally pretty introverted. I'm like, I'm just trying to make like, I, um, I like, I moved from the VI because I, it's a small Island and everybody knows everybody. But I was like, Oh, I love that. Like when I moved to the States, the anonymity of being in the States. So when like all of this blew up, everybody who knows me was like, Oh, like, it's like, Oh, wow. This is so much attention. <laughs> <laughs> so it took a while it took some time to get used to that because i've always just been like oh yeah i'm just just going you seem to be handling it just fine i just want to <laughs> say <laughs> yeah that is better than i might have uh where you are in your career to be honest with you so uh i don't i don't know if you know this but i was um, my last two years in the Coast Guard were spent as the senior defense official to Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean. So oh, I have some cool. experience of living on Barbados. I wouldn't consider to be a small island in comparison um, mm -hmm. to a lot of the other ones, but still a Caribbean island. And um, it's just, uh, you know, knowing what I know about the exposure um, that young girls have there. And in the neighboring islands, I just think it's amazing um, that you found your way to this career. And I think it's wonderful. And it's and and so like not only are you unique in the fact that you are a black woman in aviation, you're a black woman in Coast Guard aviation, but you're from the islands too. Uh, and you're not the only one. And we'll talk about yes. the uh, others uh, in a minute. But I just think it's fabulous. You're just representing so well and it's so inspiring. And uh and I have more to say about that. I just like, I'm total, I'm total spaz about the Caribbean. So I miss it. I love it. it. Okay, good. I'm like, send me back. I, that's probably my favorite. So I just, I was in, uh, at Air Station Miami and probably my favorite thing about Air Station Miami was we deployed to the Caribbean and I jumped on those deployments every chance I could get. Like that was just like, oh. What years so were you in Miami? Um, so I actually just moved from there. I was there from 2018 to you, 2022. This summer I moved. Are you kidding me? You know mm -hmm. that I live here. I live in no. Boston. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I was stationed in Miami from 2003 to 2007. And when I retired, I retired back here. And if yes. I had known that, we would have done this in person. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I literally just moved from there this summer. Like, And believe oh. me, that was like tooth and nail dragging me from Miami. Like I'm going to be back. Like I loved my time in Miami. Anybody like that says they're going to Miami. I'm just like, take me with you. I'm with you. Like I had so, so, I mean, as a helicopter pilot, I was the most proficient I have ever been at ship landings because I was deployed all over the Caribbean and it really informed 
just a lot of who I am today and what I am doing and what and working on today. So mm -hmm. that it's just awesome. Okay, good. Well, when you come back, we will get together for sure. Yes. Um, so uh, this story about you in High Flyers opens with a scene on Tuskegee Mountain Field with Admiral Charlie Ray, who uh, was this... He's the best. Such a lovely, like, Southern boy. Like, he just had this uh, Southern... A uh, good old boy, but gentlemanly way about him. And, and, uh, and there are all kinds of connotations with that, but I'm going to just clarify that this is in the very best way. Yes. Um, and how honestly, how he's we probably the nicest, like in terms of just people I've met. Um, I usually like most junior officers try to avoid, you know, meeting admirals <laughs> or being on a first name basis with admirals, but like, he is probably one of the nicest people I've ever met. And like everywhere I've seen him, he remembers you. Like he remembers your name. He remembers details about you. He did a video for me. Just like I asked and I, I kind of just asked. Um, and I didn't expect I would that get anything from me. And he was like, just, he's amazing. I have nothing. But good yeah. Time. He's the kind of person who makes you feel like you're the only person in the room when he talks to you. And yes. that is a very special skill. And a few people have it, and he's one of them. And uh, and so he's at at Tuskegee Field, and he's talking about what a special place it is, and he's getting ready to award you an air medal. And I want to tell you, I didn't know that was so. I had been out of aviation. I was in Barbados at the time, but I was in Columbia or in Columbus, Georgia. No, Columbia. What? I don't remember. Columbus, mm -hmm. Georgia. I don't know. I was two mm -hmm. hours away from Moton Field mm -hmm. when that was going down. And if I had known, I would have been there to celebrate because you were there with a bunch of my friends, to be honest. And it would have been so wonderful. But tell us about that. First of all, tell us about why you got the air medal and what was going on in Hurricane Harvey. And then uh, what that day was like. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, again, yeah, I got the air medal. Um, they actually, so I was stationed in Corpus Christi at the time. Um, and we were originally when hurricane Harvey kind of formed, it was kind of very quickly. Like I had a check ride on Tuesday and it was like Wednesday they were like, and we're, you know, evacuating the aircraft. We're about to get hit by a category four hurricane. It was like, Whoa, what? Um, so stationed there. So obviously the first set of responders coming through. So we evacuated out Thursday. We did a bunch of message block drops and then Harvey hit, obviously, um, turned last minute, hit rock. Okay. Board. Hold on. What's a message block drop? Yes. Oh yeah. So a message block drop is, um, I like to think of it as message in a bottle, but via the coast guard, it is like, think like the movie message in a bottle. It's just a little weighted, block with a little weighted bag. You put a little message in it. So I had my aircraft commander, Steve Pittman had been like, Hey, type up these messages that says like, there's a category for hurricane coming. Listen to Noah. Like if you don't know about this, <laughs> listen to this channel and get off the beaches and evacuate. Um, so I had like typed up this little message. We printed like a hundred bunch of copies of it. And then you just literally stuff the message in the block in the little like clear plastic container that has a little weight on it. And then we just fly. So we flew about a hundred feet over the water, um, over the shoreline. And then you're flying and your drop master, the person who's, you know, just throwing out these messages into the ocean. And so we throw it and we would see on the camera, people would swim up to it and pull it up and read our little message that was like, get off the beach. <laughs> There's a hurricane, um, which you should have probably known about, but in <laughs> case you didn't. <laughs> um, and then we did broadcast, but so the overall, the, what I got the air medal for was Hurricane Harvey and the efforts of Harvey, including the weather. So we did the initial evacuation out and all of the in initial like 144 response for it on the first couple of days. There was three aircraft involved. Um, pretty, that's it's Corpus Christi was a three aircraft unit. So all of the aircraft commanders, all of the pilots actually got air medals um, involved. It was just mine was because when I got it and then they also realized like, oh, I was the first. Um, but, oh, but can, can we go back? You just mentioned 144, mm -hmm. but I, I read that you're a 130 pilot. 
Which no, is- I'm an HC-144 pilot. Oh, well, I then just yes. disregard my introduction of you. And oh, also, yeah, no. I think... Okay. Yeah. My, yeah. Okay. The, nope. I'm an HC-144 pilot. That's the running joke between me and Commander Menzi. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh, no, I love um, uh, HC-144. Well, gang, gang. We got, I love my little plane. It's cute. It, uh, oh, yeah. It's, it's precious. Sky. I remember when we, when we started using them and we had a lot of jokes, but yeah. yes. Oh no. It still gets a lot of jokes. Um, I think, most affectionately called by other C-130 pilots when they see it, the baby C-130. That's, that's true. <laughs> yep, we are the baby C-130. Oh, okay, I have to tell you, so there was this little, in, in the worst possible, like, 1980s graphics ever, there was this little, like, video that went around when the 144 was coming along where it showed a falcon because mm-hmm. we used to have falcons yes. that like zipped over the scene and like totally didn't even see like the little boat in the water that needed help. Mm-hmm. And then the H-65 came along and hoisted the person up. And then the C-130 came and like dropped something. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was like this long pause. <laughs> so savage. And then the 144 <laughs> came. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we are there. Yeah, we're not... We're not quick, but we'll make it there. Um, so when I went through Corpus the first time around, when I was stationed there um, during Harvey, a lot of the pilots were Falcon transitioned to 144 pilots. So yes, heard a lot about the Falcon and all the cool places they went with the Falcon. Um, but the for Harvey got it for really bad weather. So we flew um, initial damage assessments when it had just hit Rockport. It was still a hurricane. And we flew um, into the outer bands, just trying to get to the damage assessment. So it was out Victoria, Texas at the time, which was more inland, but it was going and it was just like, probably just the worst weather you would see. If I had to sum up my Harvey experience, it was like really bad weather, but doing it with some of the, but also some of the funnest flying that I've done. Um, Like it was just, I was a first pilot at the time. I had not made aircraft commanders, so that was um, a little different. I was the most junior of the crew, but I was really excited. And um, the aircraft commander, I have 100% respect for trusting me to do this mission with him because I think that was huge. He could have picked anybody else, um, but he picked me, and I'm forever gracious for that. So shout out to Steve Pittman. Um for picking me, but yeah, we just, it was five days of like, at the time we didn't know kind of like how long we were going to be doing it, but we essentially just followed the storm up from Corpus to Rockport, kind of got hit by the outer bands. We were trying to do the assessment and it just went from like, you're seeing stuff to no visibility and just like crazy turbulence. And then flying into Houston, which was the other crazy part where it was like, they'd shut down. Houston was like pretty much shut down. Um, so any crews, but obviously Air Station Houston is a small unit. Like I think they're like a three kilo unit, but they were taking the brunt of it. Like, like even though Rockport got heavily destroyed, Houston just flooded out. And so their crews, they had to send in crews. So the 144, um, and then eventually started bringing in like per normal Coast Guard response, the fleet, everybody gets pulled in. Um, they were sending helo crews from around the country to come and help kind of relieve the 65 crews in Houston. So the aircraft would go and pick up from other airports um, like Austin or Dallas, or they would come. We started staging out of Alice, Texas, and we would bring people in. So that was what my part was for the initial like coming into Houston was like we were bringing in um, response team members as well as air like um, other pilots to help kind of relieve Houston. Um, but because there was no commercial flights coming in, because the airport was legit closed, we were flying into Ellington. The only people I'd say crazy enough to fly in to a tropical storm is the Coast Guard. Um, cause <laughs> the Duots guy, who was the weather guy, when I called him for the weather brief, he was just <laughs> like, I have to advise you that this is not a good idea. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but the weather was really bad. So yeah, we, um, Harvey, uh, at Ellington, the runways were like flooded and it was just like raining sideways. <laughs> you couldn't see anything. And then you're like, 
landing on a flooded runway. But it was great. Like, I think that's a true testament to how the Coast Guard works as a team because we, everybody was in this together. So like we were the second aircraft to land in um, the first aircraft, which was our sister aircraft coming from Laredo. It was like, hey, the runway's flooded at this point, but if you come in at this angle, you know, you can land past it or you're going to have to land short, which nobody really wants to be like, oh, I have to land before the, the runway floods out. Um, so that was great. And I think that was, it was just great to see um, everybody. I would say every aviation generation has their like thing that they get to see where they get to see the Coast Guard in action working together. That was kind of mine, which was like, I really got to see, you know, how, how fixed wing works with helos. Like, you know, yes, we are not the people that are directly saving someone's life. We're not going to hoist somebody off, but each person has an integral part to making it happen. Like if we didn't land into Houston, there would be like, how is those people going to get to help out, you know, yeah. the, um, the pilots at Houston, they would just get exhausted. So, yeah. um, but yeah, so my, the statement pretty much reads for just like, flying in a hurricane unintentionally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't, we weren't like, we're not hurricane hunters. So we're not like, let's go into this storm because yeah. we want to see what it's like. Um, you know, we had a mission to do. So we went mm -hmm. in and we were like, got to get that damage assessment. And then we were like, oh, this is bad. Let's turn back. And then obviously we had to get people into Houston and parts. So eventually by the end of it, like, you know, there was there was C-130s, C-27s coming in that really ramped up. And then the 144s took on a more of a command and control platform with like directing other, directing the helicopters where to go um, and whatnot. So it was a great, it was probably that, that experience and flying during Hurricane Maria were was probably Ooh. two of the best. That, that time frame, I was like, just like, I'm just, it was amazing. And it reminded me why I joined. Uh, yeah. And, and I was just going to say like everything that you've described just so, so well sums up what the Coast Guard, like how we operate in a, a in an environment of crisis like that together um, in like the different roles that are played to, to, help whatever whoever needs to be helped in whatever situation it's in and i was going to ask you this but i don't feel like i need to now um but uh you know a lot of times um we receive awards uh we receive these wonderful awards for for days at work that just feel like they're a normal day and then we have these harrowing moments where it's and I don't know if this happens in the 144. I can't speak to that, but I know in the helicopter, I had moments where I was like white knuckled, like, uh, am I going to get out of this? And it gets nothing. And so like, I kind of, I kind of adopted this philosophy of like, you take the awards you can get yes. <laughs> when you can get, but in this case, it absolutely sounds like the award was commensurate to the, the experience that you had in terms of like challenge and stress and also like impact. Yes. Ironically enough, if I had to compare the two, um, speaking of that, cause you're right. Sometimes you take what you get, but, um, I really enjoyed the Harvey experience just because I was so junior and I, yeah, like somebody asked me once before, like, did you think you were like, when you signed up, did, were you thinking you were going to get an award? I was like, no, I really wasn't. Like nobody signed oh, up. No, nobody signed up. Nobody nobody signs up like, oh, I'm going to get, get, get an award today. Let's this is going to be an award. Like, no, I really signed <laughs> up because I was like, they were like, Hey, a hurricane's hitting. You're going to have to evacuate anyways. And I also was like, Oh, this is going to be cool flying. And I liked who I was flying with. Um, I did the same mission with that same pilot. So the same aircraft commander, Steve Pittman, we then did about literally like three to four weeks later, Hurricane Maria operations. And truthfully, I would say out of the two that I felt the most rewarded for, um, I would say Hurricane Maria, only because that one hit close to home. And that's why I was asked. Because so you were down in the Caribbean for that one. Responding. It was. Yep. So yeah. Hurricane Irma hit the Virgin Islands and then whatever Irma didn't hit, Maria hit. 
Um, and I had a lot going on. Like I had evacuated my mom and grandmother during that time. Like I was winding down with Harvey stuff. And like, so my mom and grandmother were living with me from just getting hit from a hurricane. So when Maria hit, because it had hit the rest of my family, they came and they were like, Hey, Ronnie, do you want to do this? Because we know this is where you're from. And I was like, absolutely. So for me, that mission was more so we would bring people down to Puerto Rico, but then take people out. And I'll never forget. I, um, stationed in Miami. I was doing, um, I had been asked by, um, I can't remember. I think it was their, uh, leadership development council of one of the, the units. I think it was like the engineering unit in Miami. They'd asked me to come speak about my experience with the air metal. And right before that, this lady comes up to me and she was like, Hey, I don't know if you remember me but you evacuated me out of Puerto Rico. And like, I'm so, and I remember feeling like, wow, I remember her because I remember her story. And I remember just how emotional it was because it was like, you just, it was just the devastation in the Virgin Island, like in Puerto Rico in that area was just crazy. And like, she burst into tears when we took off. And my um, drop master, the, it was actually a load master, I guess. He was like, hey, what am I supposed to do? And I was just like, comfort her. And so I remember talking to her. I talked to her before. And it was I was trying to explain to him like, hey, wh- how she's feeling. Like, she's happy. Like, and she had said to me, she was like, I'm happy to be gone. But also like, it's a lot, you know. And so to have that experience, I would say most fixed wing pilots don't get that experience like that, right? Where we're coming full circle. So to have that, to then her come and like see me and tell me that, that she was like, you know, she was like, Oh, I'm so happy to see you. Like, I just want to say thank you so much for everything you've done. And I'm so happy to see, you know, um, you getting awarded for your accomplishments. It really just was like, wow. I, I love the experience with Harvey. I will, Maria holds a special place in my heart and that hurricane up. I'll never forget that. That was great. Well, I, I, so you say, oh, well, fixed wing pilots don't always get that. I mean, like, to be mm-hmm. honest with you, I, it, so helicopter pilots get the, the glory of maybe picking people up a lot. Mm-hmm. But, uh, the back end of that, the reconnection to hear from the person that you picked up, how that impacted their lives. That's just something that we, like, we, you, uh, me, and everybody in the Coast Guard just, we take it on and we, uh, we, we imagine and accept that what we did had a lasting impact on somebody's life, but we don't yes. typically get that feedback. Yeah. So, you know, we, we don't like I drop, I drop, I don't know, like dozens of people off at hospitals who lived mm-hmm. and I never saw them again. Um, so, but hopefully that, that, that moment in their lives made an impact for them, obviously. So, yeah. Yeah, it's not just it's not just the fixed wing pilots who have that you know that disconnect from the thing the impact that that they're having and and for you to talk about I, I just like this is so fabulous because you are just kind of epitomizing um, the altruistic like at the core you know the Coast Guard is just like any other military service mm-hmm. it's competitive there is politics there is BS that we have to deal with. Yep. Not everybody likes everybody, but the one thing that unites us all is this ideal of truly so others may live. And yes. I know that that's the rescue swimmer motto, but it's also the rest of ours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like we all, we yeah. all want to, I feel like we all on some level joined to, you know, because we like to yeah. help, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We want to, yeah. And, and it's in the great news is that you get that, like that immediate feedback, um, knowing that you supported stuff like that. So, so we're not in it for the awards, but you got yes. the award right. and <laughs> the Coast Guard put on this giant show for you. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> like that was all for you. That was, yeah. So that day is still. And not even still, that day will probably forever rank, um, unless I get married or have a kid or something and that's like ranks, like outranks it. But that day will forever, as of right now, that ranks as the most wild day of like my life. Like everybody always says, you'll never forget your wing. That's true. But I will never, I mean, I kind of like don't remember everything because it was such a daze, but I just, it was the most surreal experience I've ever had. And I was 
wholly unprepared for the level of um, recognition, I guess I was getting. Um, my mentor, I don't know if you know, Mark White had, he was the other. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hold on. I know Mark White from when he was enlisted. Oh man. Yeah. So Mark was the other pilot and Mark is like a big brother to me. We were stationed in Corpus together. And then went in, yeah. I just continually just continue to follow him. I'm not, I haven't followed him to DC, but um, Mark is like a big brother and he had tried to give me a heads up that like, Hey, this is a big deal. Um, and in standard me fashion, I was like, la, 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 like, <laughs> I'm just, just like, here I am. I'm just going to show up. Yep. Um, and I remember when I started realizing like, oh, this might be a big deal. Cause my old <laughs> boss at the time, now Captain Kennedy. Um, oh, nah. -uh. Yeah. <laughs> so he was the one that kind of put this whole thing together. He had reached out to okay. me. Okay. Now <laughs> I believe Oh, now it all makes sense. Yes. So Marcus and I, I don't know if you know this, but he calls me his air mama. Oh, wow. No, I didn't. I call myself his disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all related then. <laughs> oh, I can't wait for him to see this. Okay, yeah, he, he's great. He's awesome. He's probably going to be like, really, Ronnie? <laughs> I'm like, oh, make him proud one day. I, I did. He did. I did make him proud. <laughs> Oh, that's so great. So yeah, no, I, t I totally, I, uh, there are so many, Marcus the aviation, so, the Coast Guard aviation is a small world. It's very small, but, but even more importantly, like we, uh, he and I were running in parallel with our initiatives to sort of network and uh, bring our, our community's issues to light mm -hmm. in the Coast Guard. And so like I was running with the women's stuff and he was running with the black stuff and there was so much in common that mm. we talked and still talk all the time. So yes, he's, yeah. he's great, but he, yes, he was the catalyst for this. Um, I believe that. And really, yes. Rant, like just, he's amazing. Um, and he had called me about it because initially when my award was probably one of the last to go through, um, because I was a first pilot, everybody else was aircraft commander and it was kind of like, uh, you know, here's a first pilot, you know, um, but so eventually, so everybody else had gotten their air medal awards in Corpus. They had done a big ceremony there, but mine had still not been routed. And I had pretty much just accepted like, okay, I guess I'm not getting it. Um, and so I waited. Yeah, it was, it was a while. He can probably, he probably knows more of the backstory, but it was a while. So it just so happened that by the time my award went through, it was like about to be Black History Month. <laughs> and he was the one who like, I think he'd figure out, he's like, Oh, I think Ronnie might be the first black female, which at the time it's easy to be the first when there's five of you. <laughs> yep. Um, everything is a first, like as the first black female safety officer, but there's only five of us. So yeah, exactly. Um, everything is a first. Yeah. So he started that process, but I, he called me and he was like, Hey, we were trying to figure out whether they presented in Miami or presented at Tuskegee. They did both. Um, just cause my family wasn't going to be able to have made it to Tuskegee. So they did one here for my family in Miami for my family, which I really okay. appreciate. It was uh, captain Platt at the time. Mm -hmm. Oh no! Nah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Captain good. Platt, oh. he hooked it up, and then it was crazy. We had Admiral Brown flew in, so Admiral Manson Brown oh was my like God. doing a presentation. You got like and, the All Star team yeah. looking out for you. How? So I want to just say something. Like I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say this. Like I'm out of the Coast Guard, so I can say whatever I want. Mm -hmm. But like I just, uh, I'm so happy to hear that this um whole event was grounded in your community because part of me was like it's so amazing and it's wonderful but okay it's a pr stunt by the coast guard to you know like yes. it's, there's always this weird line that you're like okay how much are you going to exploit this mm -hmm. for your own benefit but to hear that it is grounded in your community with the people that you're mentioning just makes me gloriously happy. No, I'm they looked so out glad. for me. And I think more so because there were people that came before. So you have like um, Lashana and people that had that big kind of like 
you know, not target, but just like they were the first ever, like, you know, so I kind of had um, people enough that were senior that could kind of look out for me, which was very appreciated um, because I really did just show up. Like my part of it, like Mark White ran the Miami part, but like, I remember people were texting and like, Jenny was like, Hey, I'm hopping on a 60 and like, Oh, I'm flying. And so I was kind of just like, I was like, at the time I was like, Oh, I'm going to see my friends. Same thing. Like, la, 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 just do with me. Just here I am as a lieutenant. I just do work. Um, <laughs> And like people were texting like, oh, we're coming. But at first I was like, in my head, I was like, oh, it's a fly-in. Like, I was like, oh, it's cool. There's like a black history fly-in and then I'll just get the award. Like they'll just do like what normal and just be like quick award. Um, and Captain Platt at the time, he was like, hey, yeah, well, we'll bring people. Like each aircraft was gonna bring people up. And so then at first I was like, oh, this is a lot. Like we're bringing people, um, but it still hadn't really hit. And Mark was like, Ronnie, this is a big deal. And then I remember when I heard that Admiral Ray was coming, I was like, hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, it's a big deal. I'm I was like, oh, it's a really big deal. But then I still didn't really register until we were coming into land and I saw like all these planes and then like all these people. And I was just like, I remember right. having like, I had a full on just like, I, had, I stepped out, like it hit a point where I was like, I was overwhelmed. I was like, oh my gosh. I can't believe this is happening. Um, like I'm at Tuskegee. Um, like this is historic, like this historic place that everybody knows about. And like my, um, like I've had a family member go through there as a Tuskegee Airman. Like it just was kind of a surreal experience that I was like, wow. And Mark, I remember Mark came outside. Um, cause he, you know, he knew me. He knew probably like it was going to hit at some point that like reality was going to set in like, wow, this is a lot. And I'm a person, I hate crying in public. I'm like, I'm a suck. I was like, Cloudy with a chance of meatballs, suck those tears back in. <laughs> <laughs> so I was outside just trying to keep it together. And he came out and he was like, you good? And I was just like, this is a lot. And he was just like, yeah. <laughs> I got to the end, but it, the whole day was just kind of like a blur of like, I couldn't, I just couldn't believe that it was like happening and that it was happening to me. Oh, so, oh, there's so much good stuff in that. Like, there's just so much. Like all of the, this, ah, like I, I'm so uh, at once in, in admiration and awe and also uh, mildly uh, in jealousy of your position in your community to have that 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 funnel happening for you, um, and, and like all these people that you're talking about, I know them. I know them personally. I know some of the things that some of them went through, and I know others very very personally. Um, and uh, and the the fact that they like came around you like that and lifted you up like that just there was a time i and i'm sure you know this but i'm just going to say it here because this is a topic of conversation that we have a lot in this community but um there was a time when women uh anyway at least in the coast guard were just fighting for their own survival and they didn't want to stand out and they didn't really have the means. I mean, we didn't have social media and, uh, like back in the day, we barely yeah. had email there was no or whatever. Too so there was no way, it, there was no way for them. They were isolated at air stations, like spotted around and there was no way for them to communicate with other women. And so they had to just fucking fight for their survival in the environment that they were in. And so as they got senior, that's all they knew. They did not know how and, and, I will, and I will give our Naval Aviation sisters some props for this after having read their book in our book club in October, um, because those girls, they learned actually from the black men in the Navy how to do that shit and how to support each other. And so yeah. I'm just like here to just all the love and respect to you guys and, and, and that you got to benefit from these years of hard work that all of the people who came before you did. It just brings me so much joy. I have to, so I know like we're going longer than I, than Oh I no, you're fine. I will say that's kind of in the video I said like, and I truly stand by it. Like, 
we are a product of the people that came before us. It's like the little mm-hmm. Tuskegee Gearman video. And throughout mm-hmm. my entire life, that's pretty much been a testament. Like there are so many people that have, and I've also realized this too, there's people that have like worked behind the shadows to help me out, whether that's like, oh, mm-hmm. I was struggling at Swab Summer and <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> I made it. Thanks, Mr. Dalmida. Um, <laughs> just, you know, or like, you know, just different people. Ryan Seymour, who gives me tough love to this oh, day. Yeah. Just always, you know, he's there for me. Big brother. Oh, that's, that's He'll so let me funny. vent to a point and then he's like, we can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, so I'm going <clears> to, <throat> so we've, we've kind of like made all of these, you know, we've been dropping names that nobody, nobody uh, knows. who's listening <laughs> knows about you and I know. And I just like, let's go back to, um, I, okay. I'm going to make a confession. And, mm-hmm. and it's an embarrassing confession, but I feel like it really drives home uh, the point of representation. And you've had that in front of you uh, in the Coast Guard, which has been wonderful for you. And uh, I love that they're taking care of you. So I will share that um, the book that I'm writing mm-hmm. was inspired by, uh, by many things, by my experience in the Caribbean and with Haitian and Cuban relations and especially Haitian migrants. Um, it's inspired by this idea that we don't know what hap- like we don't necessarily know the victim, uh, that we help. Like we don't have a chance to follow up and, and hear mm-hmm. what that impact is. But it's also inspired by the fact that I, when I had the inception of this story idea, uh, which is a young adult novel about a girl who learns how to fly from a Haitian American is it Angel? Pilot? No, it's not Angel. I mean, I didn't know <laughs> Angel. This, like, this was in, I had the inception of this idea in 2005. She's a Haitian American pilot. She's a veteran, and I'll explain that in a minute. But she's also an aerobatic pilot, and she does um, uh, disaster and, and relief work. So when I had the inception of, of this idea in 2005, I knew I wanted the mentor character in my book to be a Black woman. Mm -hmm. I was stationed with Marcus Kennedy at the time. He was junior to me. He was my co-pilot on many missions. Um, But he was already working at the time, like with how to network and support the black members in in the Coast Guard aviation. And I was working for women in aviation. Uh, At the time, I knew I wanted this woman to be a a veteran, a military veteran and and a helicopter pilot, because that's what I know. But I, she needed to be retired from the military. She needed to be like, I wanted her to be a retired commander. Mm -hmm. And at the time I could not, at the time, 2005, 2006, Janine Menzi, our first female black pilot had just, the OG had just graduated flight school. So I'm a creative writer. I'm writing fiction. I can't even get to that level of fiction of there is a black woman who has had a full career in the Coast Guard and could be retired. So I'm going to make her Navy because Navy, that's probably believable. So for the last however many years I've been working on this freaking novel that I've, mm-hmm. that is really close. I'm telling you, it's really close. And I'm in what I, I like, don't is, be like George R.R. R. Martin. Finish that book. Bro. <laughs> Finish that book. You're going to wait, You're gonna wait like 10 years. It's already been 10 years. So I am revising this novel right now. So I, I rolled into the women in aviation international conference in March of last year. Yes. Janine oh, yeah. was there. Right. Janine was there. Janine was wearing her O five 5 Oak leaves. She's oh, the ops boss. And I had this like epiphany. Oh my God. So all this time I've been writing this book and this woman, this, this character, Haitian American pilot veteran has been a Navy pilot in this rewrite. She is a Coast Guard pilot. That's awesome. And, and it just, but it's awesome, but it's also like how important. And I am somebody who advocates this all the time about the importance and the whole point of me making her a black woman is the importance of representation. And I couldn't even get there with my own imagination 
until well, I wild. saw it for real. In person. And it's wild that it took, I think, like trying to explain to people when they're like, oh, like when it was only five and it was like five black women. It's like, oh, currently I'm like, no, like ever, like the first ever black yeah. woman pilot ever in the Coast Guard literally happened yeah. in the last, in the 2000s. Like that's. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Crazy. And so like in 2000. 10, I reported to Los Angeles and LaShonda, the first, the female first helicopter, pilot. helicopter pilot, was a brand new co-pilot. I mean, that's so that's where we've been. So anyway, like I just, I'm very embarrassed about that. But I also think that it really drives home this point of representation and how much you, how much you have benefited from them, but also how much you mean to, uh, young women who uh, need a role model, who need to see themselves and how great it is. You know? I saw I somewhere... It to oh, I, I'll make sure <laughs> that Janine gets this. Model. Yeah, I don't, need, I don't even think I've told her this whole story yet. So she, yeah, she needs to hear it. So I saw, I think on Sisters of the Skies, a post about you getting the keys to... <laughs> To the Virgin Islands. Thomas. Yes. Yeah, to the Virgin Islands. Yeah. All of them? I thought it was all just of them. <laughs> all of them, which is crazy. You know, the keys to Virgin Islands. <laughs> Somebody was like, that's cool. That was wild. That was also ranks as like top five crazy moments. Um, yeah, so they, um, do, because of the pandemic, it got delayed because I was actually supposed to get it in 2020, but um, they had to go through the Senate, um, the Virgin Islands Senate. Um, the Senate president passed a bill. She had was the one um, that authored the bill that routed it up and then it went through the different committees. But yeah, I got the key to the Virgin Islands, which as a native Virgin Islander, like that is just, that's like the icing on a cake that I never thought I oh, would yeah. even get. It's like, it's You're like a rock star. Me, I get red velvet Nutella cake for the rest of my life. <laughs> you like, are a rock star. <laughs> Absolutely. So that, yes, I did. That was crazy. Um, that was this May literally had gone, like just gotten back from deployment. They were trying to do it the week I was deployed and they were like, Oh, well, we can zoom you in. And my mom was like, Absolutely not. Like she deserves to be here like everybody else. Good for her. So shout Thank out to you. my mom for pushing that. And then I flew down and it was, and then literally flew down to a Sisters of the Skies event because we had girls rock wings and I did it right before. Oh, that's so cool. Oh my God. That is so cool. I want to talk to you more about that in a few minutes. So I, you know, you're uh, an 04. How long have you been in the Coast Guard? And don't give me the all my bloom and life shit. Like, <laughs> I know. So I'm going to, well, so I, I guess technically I have to say 10 years of active duty, a little over 10 years of after the academy, time, after the academy. Oh. I count the academy because that's like four years of my life. That you know, I, I know, but you got a you but. got a degree. Like the prior enlisted girl is like, well, I was <laughs> scraping barnacles off of buoys, and I didn't get a degree out of it. That's so. true, but I'm like, dang! <laughs> Shout out to C Spy, whose time counts. Yeah, I, that's fair. I, that's I, super fair. C Spy, um, but yeah. So, so, but you, so you at least have ten more years before you can retire. Is the point right? Yes. Yep. I've got a while. So, what are your goals? What do you want to be? What do you want to do? Um, I don't know. So that's kind of funny. Um, because I truthfully have said, like, I'm going to do this until, and by this, I mean the Coast Guard until it's not fun anymore. Um, that's just, wow, you just made 04 and you're over 10 years. You may as well make it all the way. I know. Well, we'll see. So it depends on where I get sent after this. Um, I'm, so I'm currently at, uh, the Navy flight school. So I'm, kind of full circle like it's crazy <laughs> Who oh i don't think i knew that so yeah. you're gonna be an instructor i am i actually just finished my um flight last week i'm waiting for my papers to sign but i am once the paper gets signed i'll be the newest advanced flight school instructor for fixed wing for multi-engine so i'm here down back in corpus um at multi-engine advanced flight training so it's kind of huge it's Someplace I never, when I was here as a student, I ever thought I'd come back to. So it's kind of crazy coming back full circle yeah. and hopefully no, making a difference. Cool. Well, so what advice do you have for young women 
And, and, you know, I didn't ask you this about being a black woman, but like, what if I see have for young black women who might be interested in aviation, might be interested in military aviation, might be interested in the Coast Guard? Tell us, what advice do you have? Um, I would say, yeah, um, it's going to sound lame, but <laughs> Nike, I mean, they've come up with good slogans. Um, just do it. Um, only so just do it, but with caveats, because... I am a realist, right? Nothing comes easy. Like in life, if it's something that is worth it, usually you have to work for it. Um, and I would say just being like black and a woman, right? You're going to have, and you probably saw, people are going to make comments. People are going to say stuff. Um, people say out of pocket things. They just, you know, just I call them it. stupid things, but yeah, yeah. That's yeah. One way to put it. Um, <laughs> but don't let that stop you. So my grandmother gave me the best advice um, because I did struggle through flight school. Like I, um, I enjoyed advanced, but primary I struggled. And like, I think a lot of, I'd say women too have like imposter syndrome. And I do, I still deal with that as like, do I really belong here? Um, I just had, you know, as I was going through instructor training, I'm like, do like, do they me as an instructor? Um, and it was funny that it took flying with the my new CEO at the unit kind of was like that validation that I needed because I was so stressed out for the flight. Um, and I remember I did the flight and it was actually like not that it was like probably the best of the flights on that block. And I had talked to him and I was like, you know, I was like, ah, I was like, maybe I need some more training flights. And he was like, no, he's like, you're ready. He was like, you did good. <laughs> and I was like, oh. But I'm like, you know, in my head, I was like, I don't know. Um, but to get over that, my grandmother gave me advice was like, never let you tell you no. Let, like, keep going until they stop you almost. Um, because sometimes we can talk ourselves out of things and we can, and like, not saying that hard things are going to happen, but like, there's a resiliency that you have to have being a woman, being black, being any minority in a field, in whatever. And you just have to kind of keep going until they stop you. Like, don't let you stop you. Don't let your fears, don't let your, you know, like, oh, that one flight, like maybe that's not the flight that you, that's going to kick you out. Like, yes, maybe you had a bad flight, but like, keep going. It's easier said than done, but like that advice has stuck pretty true. Um, especially when I was like in primary and I was like, oh, I hate it here. Um, and my grandmother was like, she gave me two things. She was like, treat every flight like it's your last because it might be um, not like, um, not like if some, like just if I get fail out, not like I die. Right, right. Um, but, and then, you know, don't let you tell you no. Um, let's, that, you know, yeah. someone else. That's, but yeah, that's, that's what I would pass is like, just do it and then know like it's going to be hard, but don't. Don't let yourself be the thing that stops you. I love all of that. Nobody told me that. I had been at sea for uh, like two and a half years before I went to flight school. And my attitude in flight school was like, they're going to have to kick me out because I'm not going back. <laughs> Unless they make me. <laughs> Never going back. <laughs> I'm not going back. They have to make me. But it was kind of the same thing. Like, yeah. Hey, I'm not going to tell me no. But, I'm going to. Like, you're you know. going to have to tell me no. Like, you're going to have to make this decision. Like, you're going to have to look at me and be like, you're end of the line. You're out. Renakwa, this was so fabulous. I'm so excited that we got to talk. I just want to remind everyone that this book, okay, High Flyers, 15 Inspiring Women Aviators and Astronauts by Anne McCallum Stats, uh, as the title says, uh, offers some fabulous wonderful role models for young people and old uh, our age as well. And um, I was so excited to see Renakwa highlighted in the Coast Guard represented in this book, but there are lots of other great stories in there. And thank you to Anne for putting that book together and, and yes. for featuring, featuring she's Ronnie. So and she's lovely. And, um, you know, we have a bunch of other women in the Coast Guard uh, in your group, Dear Fab Five now, uh, amazing eight, whatever we're going to call them. <laughs> and I hope that they and you all 
decide at some point uh, when you're ready to tell your stories because we want to hear your stories. We want to read them. We want them memorialized in books. So keep going. Keep doing what you're doing for now. And when you're ready, share your story. Thanks, Ronnie. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. I'd like to thank Shasta Ways and Michael Wilds of the Women's Soar Group for their assistance in producing this interview. The Women's Soar Group is a media company that gives women a platform to express themselves. In the meantime, don't forget to check the show notes for a link to sign up with Literary Aviatrix monthly newsletter, Blue Skies and Happy Reading. Hey.